Good morning, and welcome to our Mortgage Market Update with Barry Habib. Please let me introduce the president of CAMP, Ms. Audrey Boisneau. Audrey? Good morning. Thank you so much, Megan Jackson, and thank you so much to Barry Habib and Megan Anderson for being on with us, in addition to Kevin Casey, our president-elect for CAMP, who is with us today, too. Thank you for all of you joining us. We're really looking forward to hearing from Barry and what's been going on this week. Um, we have an update on Thursday with Dave Luna, so make sure you look for the flyers and um, updates on social media for that and register. On Friday, we are doing an NMLS eight-hour class with Dave Luna, so if you're looking to get your NMLS taken care of while you're in this lockdown phase, this is a good opportunity. We're doing another one on May 28th with two times in May that you'll be able to tune in and get your NMLS taken care of for the year. And we have some upcoming events too, which we will announce on Thursday. So with no further ado, Barry, thank you so much for joining us today. Take it well, away. It's great to be here. Megan's with me as well. Hey, Megan. Hi, I saw you put the glasses on to join me today. I did put the glasses on because I'm definitely not Nicole. So my assistant, Nicole, must have had... Uh, <laughs> must must have logged in here as me so i'm gonna i'm gonna make a change in just a minute but uh but we know i'm not nicole uh, hang on one second i'm gonna do that right now i think she wanted to log me at the same time but there you have it that's just a little bit better so hope everybody's doing great here and uh megan and audrey it's so great to see you. kevin it's great to, to be with you all too appreciate you having us and, and everyone on the call uh, we hope that you guys are healthy and you're doing well uh, there's quite a bit going on so i wanted to share some thoughts and some ideas with megan some some things going forward we've got a few slides for you so uh, we'll, we'll try to try to enjoy this time together and megan um megan anderson and megan jackson you're both going to kind of take a look at some of those questions that are coming in so please feel free to use the question box because what we're going to try to do is monitor those and uh, try and really custom and tailor this for you so i think we wanted to start off with you know, what's going on in the marketplace in general and let's start off with a, a conversation that i've continuously been having with mark calabria so he was pretty generous he gave me about an hour together um and since then there's been quite a bit of text back and forth that i've had with him and the nice thing about that is that i came away with the fact that he's been willing to be communicative and willing to look at things now my most recent text with him was really interesting because there's just a little background from somebody. I don't think we don't mind just maybe muting up here if you're not on. So my my um, most recent text back and forth with him, which was over the weekend, I was asking for some clarity as to a couple of things. One is with regards to first payment default due to forbearance. That's a tricky situation because the the credit implications are interesting. Uh, first of all, as you know, you're not supposed to have credit dings where it affects your score, but it does say if you're in forbearance and the new lender will look at that. And according to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's own guidelines, you can't take that customer and do a new loan for them until A, they have gotten out of forbearance, meaning they brought their loan current, and B, they have to wait 12 months with perfect payments for those 12 months in order to get a new loan. That means they're going to be in the penalty box for a while. So there's a good thing about that is that it's a deterrent. But what if you have uh, one of those poor individuals that truly does need it and lost their job, then they're in the penalty box. And if they get their job back and now they're in a position where they can hopefully uh, get back on track and maybe get their loan current, but the only way that they could do it with is, is with a refinance, you kind of preclude them from doing it. So he admitted that this is a tightrope that they're walking here. And he said that we will provide clarity. The other thing that was really interesting is that the window to initiate new forbearance requests, and this is a good one for us, if it happens, as he thinks, his words, there is a good chance that by the end of this month that that window will close. Now, that would be great because at least you can get an ar your arms around you know, how potentially difficult it would be to get through a forbearance period. So if the window closes the end of this month, it's just a few short weeks away, that will, I think, give lenders a lot of relief. Now, as we move forward and we think about, okay, what is it that um, what what is it that we can do to help open up, especially those of you in California, you know, the jumbo markets and then the cash out markets? Well, the jumbo markets are going to be a bit restrictive 
not necessarily in the purview of, of Mark Calabria because he's only going to handle what's going on with FHA, I'm sorry, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. That's the FHFA's domain. So jumbo loans have been more restrictive, restrictive on their own, and that's just a function of the elevated unemployment rate, which provides some more risk out there. So we got to wait and see what happens with that. Now, we're monitoring that closely. And Megan, I mean, you, you and I have been kind of working on that with Dan Habib in our office, and we've been We've been really coming up with with internal ways to calculate it. That the most recent numbers that we got from the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, they said 14.7%. But we we calculated those of you that are MBS Highway subscribers, you know, we we showed you, we take you behind the curtain, we show you how the correct way to calculate it is. We believe that uh, right now, Megan, I believe 19% is where we we're thinking the unemployment rate is, but it's starting to continue. Well, it's continuing to escalate, right? Yes, and we also have to take into consideration the PPP programs because those might be giving us kind of an artificial high on that number as well. And I know we talked about it in our morning update video that we put out every morning, but we really won't be able to see that data until, what was it, July, end of August, once that money starts to be used up? Yeah, because that eight-week term, so the eight, the, clock, the PPP works like this. Once you get the... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> once you get the PPP money, you then have, once it hits your account, you've got eight weeks to use it, payroll as well as rent. So a lot of the PPP money has hit. There's about 120 billion remaining still. So if that gets used up the end of this month, then if you take it just, you know, eight weeks out, we'll start to see through expirations sometime in June and July from that early money through the money that's being used or has not been used. So we won't really get a read until we start to see August's numbers and September's numbers, meaning that when you get the number in September, it'll re be reflective of the month of August. And we did our calculations and we think that the unemployment rate is understating unemployment, our, our numbers, which you know we said about 19%, by about 3.8% due to PPP. That is people that would normally be claiming that they are unemployed, but they're receiving payments due to the PPP program. So we think that there really is closer to a 20, let's call it 22% rate of unemployment or 23% rate of unemployment right now, about 3.8% are receiving benefits from PPP, so they're still getting money coming in, but they're not working. Now, what's going to happen is interesting is that as we open up much of the country, this is a wild card. We don't know what's gonna happen. Will people come out? Will demand be there? And if demand is there, can you even get supply? Can you get people to get off of unemployment because they're making 600 bucks a week more? They've got it for nine months. If they're coming back to jobs that were, let's just use an example of tips. So if the traffic's not gonna be there, my tips are gonna go way, way down. So is it even worth it for me to come back in? Should I sit home for nine months? Do I wanna take the health risk of coming in? even if it is more financially lucrative. So there's a lot that we have to unpack there. There's a lot of questions that we still have. Uh, and and this, is, this is an area of unemployment that will be a deciding factor on jumbos because once you see that unemployment rate coming down, the risk in that jumbo market comes out. In addition to that, that's when you'll start to see some pickup in strength in housing too. And then there's the the issue with cash out refinances which is so important for us you know cash out refinances is is a great way for you to go it really kind of insulates you from any changes in rates one of the things that's so vital and important for a cash out refi is to be able to help those families right now that are feeling the pinch because home equity lines have dried up as well and i tried to impress that upon uh, director calabria because he's provided on first payment forbearance a avenue for purchases that have that first payment default, first payment forbearance, because the loan wouldn't be sellable. Now, many of you already know that there's this upcharge of 700 basis points, and if it's a first-time home buyer, 500 basis points, which I have to admit, you know, Megan, you two, you claim, you had made the same claims I did, that that seemed pretty outlandish, right? So uh, until we did our research, and we found out from four independent sources that the approximate correct level of risk that has to be built into that transaction is about 600 basis points because that loan becomes more risky due to the fact that you now have a loan that potentially could go into foreclosure or the payments lagging is something that people don't want. So because of this, there is, I guess, appropriate markup on this of 700 basis points or 500 basis points. 
that would have to go into this. And I asked, why aren't you doing this on cash outs? And for some reason, they deemed cash outs to be more risky. And they said it would be a thousand basis points or 10 points. And he said, people would have my head. They were already giving me already all kinds of flack over 700 basis points. So I, I kind of broke down the numbers with them. And there's a very small percentage that would be first payment default anyway, but even much smaller than that on a first payment default on a cash out refinance. And I'm asking him if he could live with 700 basis points. So that's the research that he's doing right now, because if they could live with 700 basis points, then he would open up that market and you can get rid of a lot of the overlays that exist right now. Some of these overlays you might be seeing, you know, 500 basis points on any cash out refinances, which by the way, Megan, it probably still makes sense for a lot of folks. You know, even with that, the examples I think we talk about is taking somebody from three and a half to 5% with the right advice. Uh, we have a debt consolidation tool that does that. It's, it still makes enormous amount of sense to do so, but heck, if we can get rid of that team, that would be great. So Barry, um, can I jump in here and ask a question quickly? Please. So if they end the forbearance window at the end of May, all of this really goes away, doesn't it? So in theory, we have another three weeks of this, two weeks of this, and then that question is gone. And then are, does that solve all our problems? Do they just not even need to address it at that point? Then what, what happens next? So it's a great point that you make and you're reading my mind. That's exactly right a lot of this stuff goes away if new forbearance requests stop after the end of this month. So that clearly gets rid of the first payment default risk. Now you'd still have some that would, you know, if you close May 30, May 25th, May 30th, whatever, around that last week of May, remember that first payment default risk, even though there'll be no new uh, forbearance requests, the first payment wouldn't normally hit until the beginning of July. So we'd have the month of June for some, mm -hmm. some some wobbly areas there potentially, but it would seem to me that at least you could be, can put a fence around this thing and you could say, okay, right. how much capital do I have to raise to get through this period? And if it's not infinite, you can model. Right now it's hard to model because if you're gonna raise capital, think about it, You know, anyone listening, if you were to raise capital and you're going to whatever, uh, someone else or a lender, a bank, whatever it is, they're going to want to know, what do you need it for? Well, I need to get through this period. Then thing will be, okay, okay, how long is this period? If you go, that makes it harder to raise capital, doesn't it? But if you say, listen, here's the deal. This is the amount of forbearances that we can model, that we could think because it's going to end at this point in time. So we need cash for the first four months worth of payments to get through it. Here's how much cash we need. Here's how much we expect to make. Lender might say, okay, I can evaluate that and I can I can feel comfortable with that. But unknown makes all of us feel less comfortable. So right. that's what we plus is an LO, it helps the conversations with our borrowers where we can say, okay, we know that this is going this should be changing in six weeks. Let's get the process going. Let's get you all teed up. And then let's just wait it out. So we're ready, but we're waiting for the you know, for that danger to go away and then we can get our loans closed and have some sort of idea when that might be for our clients, which is hugely important. So, so correct, Audrey. And in addition to that, I mean, just think about it. There's a lot of lenders right now telling their customers that if there's any doubt, go into forbearance. So you, you might think to yourself, why in the world would they want to do this? In fact, Audrey, here's a statistic that most people don't know. Do you know that nearly 30% of people in forbearance actually made the payments? Yes. For April? 30%. Yep. So why, why? Everybody is wondering why, why, why? Here's why. Is because if you get into forbearance, well, then you know what the limit is on the amount of cash you have to lay out, and that's four months, because then the FHFA starts to pick it up after that. But if you wait a month or two months before you start, and then the forbearance clock starts, well, now you have potentially six or seven months or eight months, so you make your exposure much greater. So all they're trying to do is, again, the unknown is worse than you know th than than having a difficult time to get through because at least you can model it and get around it and manage cash flow around it. Unknown is a very difficult thing, so they're just searching for certainty, even if it hurts. Right. Well, it's interesting. I'm sure you're hearing the stories from some of the larger banks where somebody literally just clicks on the button asking or inquiring like what are the, what's the deal with a forbearance and they're in forbearance now they can't make their payment so they have to battle through that so. That's, that must be what that's all about, is let's start the clock now. Interesting. Interesting. That's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. We talked to everyone, Megan, myself, Dan, we talked to all of these different lenders and 
you know, they're having a tough time. I mean, thank goodness we got past the margin call issue. That was the big one to get because that was inflicting the most pain uh, in the most acute situation. So once we were able to get past that, I'm very proud of our team, I'm proud of Dan and Megan, myself, getting in front of the Fed and getting them to stop the crazy purchase. They didn't want to do that. They just didn't understand how the plumbing worked. So that was the big one. And now the good news is, is that all that margin money that they laid out, which was so painful and putting them on the brink of insolvency, a lot of those closings are taking place and they're getting that money back. So they're becoming, they're healing, they're becoming yeah. more whole. And that is helping them to get through this forbearance period of time, which is why it would be great if it stopped so we can we can move on. And, and look, if I could talk about why I think this is such a great thing going forward for us is because the place we're going to is just absolutely incredible. You know, the inconveniences that we are dealing with right now should be viewed as exactly that. They are, they're clearly giving us heartburn and they're inconvenient. But look, obviously we're in much better places than some of those individuals that are, their inconvenience and their hardship right now is to put food on the table, right? So we're not in that position. So perspective is important. However, where we're going is absolutely wonderful. So what I'd like to do, Megan, if you wouldn't mind coming back, is one of the things that we need to be doing is some great stuff with social media right now. And Megan, why don't we talk to that a little bit? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up some slides that will be relevant for you because I really want to share with you and show you just how good this is about to get for us. Okay, so we'll get a little excited here. Um, I'm excited about it. And I think that, there, that we're headed for a wonderful place. So Megan, talk about that. I'm going to get some slides prepped, bring them on here, and then we'll tag team this back and forth if that's okay. Yeah, so I just want to mention as far as social media is concerned, right now, you guys know this, we're in social distancing, we are unable to go into the office, a lot of us, I know the world is starting to slowly open back up, it'll be interesting to see how this kind of plays out, I know Mississippi was one of the states that has started to open up and their number of cases has actually increased since doing so, now we also have to think that they're doing more testing now, so maybe it's just a case of doing more testing. But regardless, people are spending more time at home and we need to stay top of mind with those individuals and really get out there and educate them. So if you have not been utilizing social media to do this or video in general, I'm really going to push and encourage you guys to do so. And a lot of the times I get comments like, well, you know, I have a face made for radio. I don't really like the way I look. I gained 25 pounds this last year. I feel really uncomfortable. No one wants to see me on video. And this is what I want to say to you. Is first off, every single client that you're going to work with or you have worked with, they know exactly what you look like. They know exactly what you sound like. You don't actually sound any different on video or on a recording than you do normally, as much as you might think you do. You sound exactly the same. And if you think otherwise, record yourself and play it for someone that you trust that won't judge you. And I guarantee they'll come back and say, no, that sounds exactly like you. And we really need to get over our fears of judgment when it comes to video, because you're creating these videos, not because you feel uncomfortable in your body, you're creating these because you wanna help that client mitigate their fear, help them feel more confident in their decision making, and ultimately make your job easier by answering questions and concerns and pain points that they have through videos so that you don't have to do it on the phone or through email. We are trying to optimize our time and stay top of mind. So we do have a tool in MBS Highway to help with this. It's called Social Studio. We have scripts in there, you know, why is now a good opportunity to buy, clarifying forbearance, things like that. And I mean, if you can read, you can do this video. And if you feel uncomfortable and you know that's a trigger, just don't go back and watch it. <laughs> and and so, Megan so kindly before we started offered to do a social media class for us for camp. And we're gonna take her up on that. So we'll get that set up in the next week or so and um, get her teed up so that you can learn everything she has to share with us, which is wonderful. So thank you, Megan, for that. And thank you for Barry, to Barry for letting that happen too. We really appreciate it. Oh yeah, Me Megan. Megan's as good as it gets. I mean, she should be very helpful. So I'd like to share my screen. You just have to give me permission to uh, be able to share my screen. And I've got some things to go over with you guys here. 
Uh, so the first thing I, I want to uh, go over, so I'm just waiting for that permission. There we go. Make my show my screen now. I believe you guys can see where we are. So um, essentially, when I was on um, this, this was on Fox. Was one of the Fox ones. You know, we talked about interest rates being lower and where they're headed. And you know, sure enough, we we had made some crazy predictions on rates. They all came to be. Uh, I made the one about the rates going to a half a percent. People wanted to debate me. Nobody believed me on the 10-year. Sure enough, we got there. We got down to 0.31, actually. And even though we've seen them come up a little bit, they're still at really low rates. And what I will tell you is that you can expect a low-rate environment for a very long time. Look, since the beginning of mankind, everywhere in the world, every place in the world, every time government debt rises, it puts pressure on interest rates to decline. So you're going to continue to see, based upon all the debt that we have now put ourselves in, slower growth because you have to service that debt. So there's less income to do things with that's discretionary, less less funds to do things that are discretionary. So much has to go to servicing debt, and that will continue to put a drag on the economy. You're going to have rates pressured lower with the highest rates anywhere in the world, practically. And the Fed, who's now pushed rates essentially to zero, the last time they did that, they kept them there for seven years after the Great Recession. There's not going to be any from the bottom up pressure on rates. You will have top-down pressure on rates. So you're going to see rates in a position where they will be continuously on the lower bound. Now, rates should probably be about two and five-eighths, two and three-quarters. You've got some premiums layered there. You've got a premium for capacity. You've got a premium for forbearance risk. And you've got a premium for the elevated risk that's associated with unemployment. So if you were to take those out of there, you'd be at much lower rates than you have now. But the rates we have now, let's face it, they're freaking awesome, right? So what we need to be able to do is understand that there's going to be an enormous opportunity market-wise for us. Now, jumbos will come back. You know, you're going to have forbearance that will go away. A lot of these things will start to happen and we'll be able to unpack them. But what I want to explain to you is that you are going to be in a really good position here with regards to the overall market. So I'd like to address this in a couple of different ways. First of all, you know, let's look demographically. People are waiting longer to get married and because of that, what you're going to see is that 30-somethings, people's age is 30 to 39. When you take a look at if they were living alone, there's a 38% home ownership rate. We see here that there's about an 80% home ownership rate with just having one child. So there's an enormous jump. So we have to understand that this is a big thing. Now, the baby registry, well, that's at its highest level since Google's been, been thinking about this. So we know this household's going to be formed. And there is presumed to be a post-baby baby boom after being quarantined, potentially. Maybe divorce rates go up and maybe baby rates go up at the same time. I don't know which it's gonna be, but I do believe that there's some truth to that. And if that's the case, I mean, there's gonna be a big demand on home ownership just at a time when inventory is very, very tight. To begin with, the demographics are really favorable, team. If you take a look at the median age of a first-time home buyer, it's 33 years old. That means they were born right here, 80, 87, let's call it, 86, 87, depending on when their birthday was. But if you look at the birth rates, they went up here, up, 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 which means there will be more and more of them coming every single year, just at a time when we have very low inventory. And if you wanted to take a look at something just for point of reference, the housing bubble that we had had in 2006, why is this different? Well, in 2006, we had lots of inventory, but we didn't have an influx of people. Why? Because those first time home buyers in 2006, if they were 33 years old, they were born in 1973 and birth rates plummeted then. Why? Because in January of 1973, abortion became legal. So you have an enormous drop and decline in birth rates. They remained low. And then in the future, what that caused was that caused household formations to dip. So you can see here, this follows kind of like a hand in glove what the birth rates were. So if you look 33 years later, as the, the those low birth rates after the legalization of abortion happened, what you see is you see very low household formations. But at the same time, builders in gold were putting up all kinds of homes and you had more homes built than people that needed them. Today, it's the opposite. Formations are going up and will continue to go up. Builders not keeping up. And by the way, 2020 households being built way down because of COVID. So this will exacerbate situations and it will put people in a situation where you'll have more and more and more demand going forward. This is all at a time when you have inventory levels at historic lows. So you kind of got all the pieces of the puzzle together for a great opportunity to buy a home. 
And to the extent that you can, you have to tell people. Now, I know a lot of you guys are in, in California. You're going to say, okay, so what is the risk to my marketplace? And what I want you to take a look at here is that these are the high risk job markets. So in other words, as you can imagine, Vegas, you know, that's a very high risk market right now because they're so dependent on travel, they're so dependent on tourism, they're so dependent on those casinos doing well, that that's gonna get hurt for a while. So 35% of their jobs are in a high risk market. That's a marketplace that's gonna suffer a little bit more from the real estate side. Orlando, why Orlando? I've got that highlighted because listen, Disney, right? So it's an easy one for us to relate to. No wonder why that's a tough market. But if you start to look here and you kind of find like Inland Empire, you, know, you do have a significant amount, about 20% of your jobs, but it's much less than other areas as well. And as you start to take a look at some of the other ones, San Diego, Orange County, again, are also around that 20% range, but not very different than some of the other markets that you're seeing. Sacramento, a little less than 20%. You get into the Bay Area, a little bit less than that, maybe 18% or so. So you can start to see that you know San Jose, 16%, the California markets should hold up a little bit better especially when you take a look at the low risk job losses. So we start to take a look at low risk jobs, the percentage of jobs that should be very well protected during COVID, Sacramento is second in the country, okay? San Diego is fourth in the country. And you can see that you've got Inland Empire, very, very strong level of jobs compared to the rest of the nation. As you can imagine, Orlando doesn't fare very well here, but Orange County, interestingly enough, is not going to be uh have does not have a lot of jobs that are very well insulated uh to this covid market so this 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 environment might disproportionately impact the housing arena in orange county more than some of the others now when you take a look at the overall environment the search for homes for sale well it's never been higher than it is right now so what's the fair value of housing are homes overpriced going into this the price to rent ratio. So take take the annual rent times by 17. That's the average price of a home. It's a good metric. When we got into trouble, this was roughly 24 times. So it's 17. The price to replace is 1.59. When we were in trouble, it was a 2.2. So we went into this with homes valued very, very favorably right now. And the other thing that's going to preclude us from getting a big housing downturn is vacancies of homes. Home vacancies, really, really, really low. As you could imagine, home vacancies when we had the housing crisis were quite high. About 11 to 12 percent of that housing stock was already vacant, which made it very susceptible to a downturn. At these levels, really, you know, just just a good market. If you think about when the housing market really started to take off, if you were in the business about 20 years ago, you know that that was such a good time to buy because vacancies were so so low. And we've seen that through recessions like we're in right now home values have held up exceptionally well during recessionary periods. So we know that we're gonna hold up well because why interest rates stay very low. If we take a look at the housing picture, let's take a look at it. There's 124 million households, 43 million of them are rented, 80 or 81 million are owned. Now of those owned, 34% are owned free and clear. Free and clear, 53 million homes remaining, they have a mortgage, but the average LTV, Check this out, it's 53, the average equity 177. That's why it is so critical for us to look at cash out refinancing because it's such a great option. And it also means that these people have a boatload of cash to move up. So the housing environment is looking great. So our home, our now we've done a good job of this. Megan, Dan, myself, our team here at MBS Highway, we've won the Crystal Ball Award, which boy has some pretty, pretty impressive company you know when you get Goldman Sachs you're going up against and Morgan Stanley and Wells Fargo and Bank of America and all these big teams and housing experts and you know little old us we've been the most accurate real estate forecaster two of the past three years and this that year in between that we weren't wasn't like we slacked off we came in third so we've had uh, outside of that four top 10 finishes where we did not actually have the highest or win the award for but we've been pretty darn close um and the last year when we won it, obviously we're very proud of that. Our team puts a lot of work in, Megan and Dan and myself especially. And what we're seeing is we're seeing that the hit will be mitigated for all the reasons that we're talking about. We're seeing a decline in home values, about one to 2% overall in the country, but up over 5% in 2021. So what does this tell you? 
if you can, you buy a home now because this is a great opportunity. Now, for you folks in the mortgage game, what is your life going to look like? In a word, busy. I want you to know this, that you're only going to be limited by the amount of work you want to do, the amount of hours in the day, and how much money you decide you want to make because it is truly unlimited. No bullshit here. You are going to be in as great a situation as you can imagine for a long time. Let me explain why. So right now it's forecasted that we're going to do 1.3 trillion in loans that are refinanced and on purchases we'll do about 1.1 trillion in loans. So 2.4 trillion altogether, maybe a little bit more, 2.45 trillion. You're busy right now. I mean, there's a lot about a lot of business out there. Purchases will come back. Purchases will resume where they should be about 1.3 1.3 trillion, but refinances well, let me show you. Now, here's some data from Black Knight. Black Knight is saying that if rates were at 3%, that you'd have about 19 million households. Now, as I mentioned to you, they should be about two and three quarters. So will they average around 3% in the future? Yeah, but between three and three and a half percent is where they should be. But Black Knight says 19 million people could refinance, but wait a second, they put some qualifiers on it. The first one makes perfect sense to us. You gotta be a mortgage holder in good standing, so great. But they also said that you have to have at least 20% equity. Well, that eliminates a lot of folks. There's a lot more people that are qualified, that are in good standing, that would benefit from refinance with a 90 LTV or a 95, right? Why not? They don't count that. That you have to have at least a 725 FICO, but you could do a rate and term refinance for people with a 700, couldn't you? 680, couldn't you? Yeah. And they have to save three quarters of a percent. Well, especially where you are, some of those loan amounts that you have, they're 400,000 or more, a half a percent would make sense. Or if you do a very low or no closing cost transaction, maybe even less than that where it would make sense. So we think that this is a really conservative number, but even with that conservative nature, 19.2 million homeowners, even if your loan amount were only 250,000, that's 4.8 trillion. Team, just think about that in refinances. If we are having a tough time handling 1.3 trillion, this is an avalanche of transactions that you will have to pick from. So this is an important point for us to think about. I know that it's easy to get caught up in some of the aggravation that's out there. And believe me, I'm not kind of disrespecting it at all. I originated loans for over 20 years. I'm one of you folks. So I know how much of a disappointment it is to not do a loan or have guidelines change on you or be more strict. It's, it's, it's a lot of heartburn there. But what I'm trying to say is, is that change your focus, change your mindset. Don't, to the extent you can, don't pay as much mind to the ones you can't do because there's a universe of loans that you can do out there. So this is really good news for your team and those restrictions will be lifted. You know, we get this forbearance thing to stop, a lot will improve. Country starts opening up, we will start to see unemployment come down. And then God willing next year when we get a vaccine and we're, we're in a position where things really change, boy, oh boy, oh boy, are we gonna be in great shape and great position team? Really, you are, you pick the right business to be in. It's about as good as it gets. Gosh, Barry, that is amazing. And exactly what we all need to hear about four times a day. So thank you very much for that. And just another reminder that when you're talking about national statistics and national appreciation and depreciation, I mean, in the Bay Area and in California, a lot of times our numbers are a little different or better. So make sure you're looking and focusing on our local markets and not watching the national news to get your information. And on that, I wanted to say that Megan had, I had asked Met your Megan, whether your models were modeling what you're projecting is coming. And it sounds like you are. And she had had a really good explanation for that. So when they are doing their demo after this, or when Megan is showing us their program, showing us how to predict to your clients what is going to happen you guys have already adjusted for that right give me a give me a zip code in the bay area exactly uh, nine one. four five <laughs> nine six <laughs> yeah is that right what'd you say is that right nine four five nine nine four, six nine four five nine six okay team so what this will do is it knows you're in contra costa county but it also goes specific to the zip code and it will tell you, boy, you picked a nice neighborhood there. Median home price, 1.236 million. Now I will tell you that even though you've got these rates of appreciation, if the home value were less than this, the rates of appreciation would probably be greater because we changed this. This will reflect, this was supposed to be like six and a half percent rate of appreciation. 
due to COVID, it's going to be 4.3 because remember, much of this for 2020 was already built in through March. So this is adjusting for, you know, taking into consideration the benefit, but then the decrease that we expect to see. So you're still going to have a great year in uh, in, in the zip code in, within Contra Costa County. And if you take a look over the next five years, you see what's happening here. Now, remember, this is adjusted for purchase price. The higher the purchase price, the lower the numbers would be. So if you said it's a $3.5 million home and you use that number, you'll see the numbers change slightly. So they decrease. So what, what we try to do is we account for the fact that the higher up you go, there is less of an appetite. So we, we make those adjustments as you go to the appreciation levels. The, you know, it's going to reflect in every single market what the actual numbers will be. So let's go back to, because I have a few more things on here I'd like to go over if you'd like, Audrey. I'd love it if you do that. Thank you. This is amazing. So um, Megan, you know, let's, let's kind of go through this together. So if somebody purchased a home a year and a half ago and that home were, you know, for 500000 to put a number on it, and the loan amount were $400,000. And they said, okay, I can benefit from a refinance today. I could save some money. I could save $230 a month on a refinance by saving seven-eighths of a percent on that. So you guys come across this all the time, right? So what, what happens is, is that on a 15-year, they could even save more in rate, but it would cost them more. And then we take a look at what the closing cost would be, and let's just pick a number here just to make it easy. So they're going to save 230 but their closing costs are 2300 Now, if I ask pretty much anybody, anybody, when would they break even? What would the answer be? All right, you guys can, can kind of tell me. I, I bet you everybody's saying, you know, 10 months, right? No, that's not the case. It's not 10 months. Let's show you why. So it's not 10 months because, yes, indeed, you're saving 230 and that would change the payment from 2755 to 2525 That's the $230 a month. But that's what your payment is. That's not what you're saving because part of the payment is principal. That's your own money. Why would you include your own money? If it's your own money, if you're putting money from your left pocket into your right pocket, are you saving that money? No, you're not saving that money. You didn't save money on that. You're saving interest. And the interest is a savings of $264 a month. The rest is going to principal, which is your own money. So it's not 2,300 in closing costs divided by 230. It's 2,300 in closing costs divided by 264 savings and interest. And what you have is it's not 10 months. In this case, it's nine months. Many times it's eight months. And what I'm trying to impress upon you is having the right information that your competition doesn't have will destroy your competition. And even other tools out there that try and do this, nobody gets this right. We're the only ones that get it right. Get the right information. This is taken right from MBS Highway. And this is the kind of stuff we do. And if you take a look on a 15 year, you'd never break even on a 15 year because your payment's more. But what you could see is that on a 15 year, your savings in interest is $500 a month. So the break in even period is five months on a 15 year. Okay, so this is the way to do it. You know, Megan was talking about that opportunity that you all have right now to do it right with a cash out refinance. And there are still a lot of those. And even if that cash out refinance exists where you have to have a little bit of a premium, take a cash out refinance for a home at four and a quarter percent rate. And the original purchase was in 2017. The original loan was $400,000. You know, you've got a home value today that's six hundred and thirty eight thousand dollars and your loan balance is three eighty so they've got equity in the home but the proposed rate would be three and a half percent today you know it looks great but by doing that the refinance would would then save you two hundred and forty six dollars your closing cost would be let's call it four thousand dollars you'd have a new 30-year term that you'd have to be dealing with a lot of people say ah, i'm starting all over for 30 years well what if we just said hey look you've got a lot of equity in your home let's take a look at your debt picture and just like a normal family, they've got a car payment, they've got 20,000 in credit cards, they've got some money in Best Buy and in Macy's, and they've got alimony. So now they've got all these things, and when we take a look at it, this is again within the MBS Highway environment, we're going to be putting them in a position that's gonna save them 246 a month, but hold on a second. Rather than just save them some money, they have a lot of equity in their home because now they started off at an ADL TV, but through appreciation and amortization, which we instantly calculate depending on when they purchased on their home in your specific zip code, they have $95,000 in equity that they could use. What if they use some of this to pay off a debt, increase their loan amount? What would that do? So if you click on the Chevy, well, man, now you're saving $691 a month. And if we click on the rest of them, I could save them $1,800 a month, $1,800 a month. I can click on alimony all I want. It's not going to change. That sucker is not going away. But we still got some white space here. I still got $39,000. Well, 
it'll know where you are. So if in this particular case, you happen to be in Atlanta or wherever you are, it'll figure it out. It knows what people are doing in that market. Like for example, not a lot of people are doing finished basements there. If you were here in New Jersey where I am, a lot of people are doing those. So it really depends on when you, when you, where you are as to what people are doing, then you can make a suggestion. Well, in Atlanta, a lot of people are renovating their bathroom, 39% of them. So 74% of homeowners in the next 12 months are going to do one of these, and 82% of those will take out a loan for 18000 Customer says, yeah, I want to do that. I want to do the bathroom. So what you want to do is you take out $15,000 to do it, and now instead of saving, look at the previous slide, instead of being able to save $17.95 a month, what we'll do is we'll save $17.27 because we took out a little bit of cash out in order to make that work. But rather than just take that $17.27 and pocket that money, because remember, the ratios are low. They don't really need, need that money. They were fine with the payments they had. They had a low rate. What if we just showed them something, an interesting concept? Take the savings, apply it all towards principal on the new mortgage. What would happen? Well, if we applied it all towards principal, your new mortgage would be paid off in 12 years and five months. That's 14 years and eight months saved in payments. That means that if you took a look at taking all of your existing balance plus your debts, rolling it into a new mortgage, you would now save 14 years and eight months or expressed differently, you'd save 176 payments. Wow, how good is that gonna feel? 176 times saving a $3,000 plus a month payment. That's like the best retirement plan you could give these people. Think about, and this is guaranteed. This isn't, well, if the stock market does this or bonds, that, no. This is guaranteed. And after five years, you don't have to wait 12 years and five months. What happens after five years? If you left it alone, you didn't do anything, you would amortize $41,000. You do what we're telling you as your debt manager, as your mortgage advisor, not a salesperson, because we want you to be advisors, you'd save $159,000 amortization. It's a benefit of $118,000 in five years, and it's tax-free. You guys got any other tax-free benefits in five years are going to give them $118,000? What's your customer going to say? What about 10 years? What about after the loan's paid off? $332,000. Can you use an extra $332,000, Mr. Client? I mean, think about that. Now, what if the customer said, hey, you know what? I wanted to take some money and put it in hand, that $246. Remember, that's what we were going to save them on a refinance. Initially, before we used this strategy, we said the customer was happy to save $246 a month. So what if we still give you the $246 a month, but take out enough money to pay off all your other debts and do the bathroom and apply that towards principal? In other words, just restructure your debt. Make the same payment you're making now minus the 246 you came to me for to save on a refinance. Well, the loan is 13 years and seven months. I'm going to save you 13 years and six months or 162 payments. And you're going to save $316,000, team, over the life. And on top of that, you got a new bathroom and your home value is worth more. Team, this is the easiest way for you to make money. Easiest, easiest way. Just a quick real life scenario. Megan was there for, for, for this when uh, you know Gary came in to, to talk to us about this, and this was his debts. So Gary was a landscaper making a lot of money, and his payments were $27,000 a month in debt, $27,000 a month. There's no shortage of what people will give you. I bet you when you go home today, you're going to get a couple of credit card offers in the mail today, pre-approved. So poor Gary had Lyme disease and was, was, was in a bad spot for a period of time, had no money coming in, had to take on all his debt, medical bills, and now he put himself in a pretty big hole, but he had equity in his home like most people. So by doing the same strategy, we were able to save him $26,000 a month, $26,000 a month. I said, hold on a second. You're strapped for cash right now. Here's what I, I want you to do. Spend $10,000 a month of that savings. You're going to save 26. Go, you and your wife have a good time. 10,000 bucks a month. Enjoy your life. But take, give me the other 16,000 to apply towards principal. And if we do that, you're gonna pay your mortgage off in two years and two months. You're gonna have an extra $465,000. Team, this was one where the guy actually cried. 50 plus years old, cried. His wife in tears. Best part was his son driving to see me and saying, thank you, Mr. B, for changing my family's life. I mean, this is the type of stuff you get to do every single day by just using the tools that are in front of you. I'll tell you what, speaking of young people, this is where the expansion is. And boy, nobody better than Megan to tell you how to market to these people through Instagram and through other resources, because this is where it's at. The biggest change in home ownership rates is coming amongst those under 20 
five. That's right. You read that right. Between 25 and 29, also very big. Just look at this demographic here. Between 30 and 34 years old, only a 50 basis point, half a percent increase. The big change is coming from the youth. And as you can see it, that happens here. People are aging in place. If you're over 70, only 5% of that population is moving. If you're between 50 and 54, only 9% is moving. The big movement is happening here. These are where people are mobile and moving. Those youngsters, they are moving often, half of them, more than half of them moving every year. But even if you're just between 30 and 35, 22% of those people are moving every year. That's the market. If you're a realtor, if you want to help your realtor, this is what you have to go after because this is where the transactions are. So that means when realtors who are typically much older, they need somebody like you to teach them how to market to this. They need somebody like Megan who will teach them how to do this type of marketing, which is where it's all at. And one of the best ways, Megan mentioned this, was Social Studio. We've got all the scripts to do it. And all you got to do is read a one minute script. We turn your computer into a teleprompter. You could change the, the font size. You could change the scroll speed. You accesses your camera. You could do it on your phone. You click it. You could do it on your computer. You click it. And then it reads it for a minute. If you like it, great. You don't like it, do it again. One click, post it to Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. Megan, you want to chime in on this one? It's so easy to use. And it's so helpful when you're first getting started with videos to just ease into it and get comfortable. And I'm telling you, it's going to save you time. One of my favorite scripts that I've heard a lot of talk about is when the Fed cut rates to zero and you guys were getting bombarded with phone calls. Does this mean I get a 0% mortgage rate? And you had to spend 10, 15 minutes on the phone with these people when what you could have done just went here, filmed this video, and sent it to everyone that asked that question and posted it on your social media platform so that many less people started talking to you about it. Yeah, it's, it's awesome, team. It's awesome. And look, I know right now open houses are not really in vogue, but what's really important that people still need to market it. So our open house flyer is one that you could text. So not only does it look beautiful, you just put the MLS number and you're done, but you could do a cost of waiting analysis, which were the only ones that get this right, that have the actual data. You could show them appreciation and you could show them both historical and forecasted and demographics and product comparisons, schools, hot links to Google Maps for eateries, points of interest, everything. Guys, this is the best open house flyer that's out there. It's built into the MBS Hire platform. You need to be doing this. And then, hey, you know what? Have a presence on the Realtors website. They love this because this will give you buy versus rent. That real estate report card that we just looked at before, you can have Realtors clients access it from the Realtors website, except it'll have your information all over it. So what you can do is just put this widget on the Realtors website. It's like the best way to infiltrate. I mean, you will have the realtor wants you there because it will drive traffic to their website and drive traffic to their listings. But meanwhile, you're the one that is behind all of it. So, team, just want to mention to you, if you'd like to get on board with the MBS Highway, we do a video every morning. That's pretty awesome. Things like the report card, the, the, the tools like the buy versus rent, the tools like the cost of waiting analysis, the tools like the real estate report card. Uh, it's all in English and Spanish, too, which is a big thing. Our loan comparison tool is nothing like it. There's so many great aspects of it, but this is just one tiny piece. You told your customer four or five different products. All they want to know is which is the best for me. This shows them a timeline. If you're here for less than three years, it's this. This period, it's this. This period says you can add, remove products instantly. The social studio. And then we've got a screen recording tool. There are other wonderful screen record tools. Ours is built in. We've got a screen share built in. There's so much. The average person makes $35,000. And then we've got pricing that is you know, really attractive for you guys for camp. So Nicole at MBS Highway or Megan at MBS Highway, M-E-G-A-N at MBS Highway, send an email to them and you can get this pricing honored for you. So that's kind of what we wanted to, to show you. Um, and by the way, if I could plug my book here, Money in the Streets, it's a great book. It'll be available October 27th, but you can pre-order it on Amazon. Love to get <laughs> you guys on there. So, uh, so that's it. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. All right. We're going to re we're going to send the offer to camp members from MBS Highway out again this afternoon. So look for it. There will be a link where you can sign up with their service and have access to all these tools. And I didn't know you were going to be an author. That's very exciting. Can't wait. Thank you. Thank you. It's a really good book. We got some really high praise. Randy Zuckerberg wrote the forward and Tony Robbins wrote a beautiful piece in there too. So it's it's a really meaningful book. I think you guys will like it if it's uh, 
if you're going through a great time, it'll help you get to your next level. If you're going through a tough time, and we all do from time to time, it'll help you get through it. But mostly it'll help you find the opportunities that are out there. That's what the title of the book's all about, finding the money that's right there in the streets right in front of us that uh, others are passing up. Well, thank you so much for everything, both of you, and to Megan and to Kevin. We so appreciate your input and your insight. And I'm really happy to hear that um, FHFA has somebody who's in the trenches and has been forever, uh, you know, whispering in their ear, letting them know, you know, how it all translates in the end. So with that, We'll say thank you to both of you and have a wonderful week, everybody. And we'll see you on Thursday. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye.